Welcome to Opalest TV. I am in Freienbach, which is a small village outside of Zurich, together with Dr. Hans-Peter Boller, who is the co-founder and managing partner of Sequero. Dr. Boller, tell me, what is Sequero? What do you do? Well, Sequero is a specialist manager for insurance-linked securities. That's the asset class that we're focusing on entirely. So that's what we do. And we've been doing this for the last five years. The company was founded five years ago, started with its flagship fund um, in 2008, um, May 2008, the first fund was launched. And since then, we've added other funds and mandates to our activities. Tell me a bit about your own background and also about your partners and the key people in your company. The company, as I said, was started uh, five years ago, it was started by myself and Dirk Lohmann. Dirk and I had been colleagues before. We both come out of the insurance or reinsurance industry. So really, we're, our entire life has, we have actually spent in the insurance and reinsurance industry. My background is one of, of an actuary. I worked for uh, one of the big consulting firms, so actuarial consulting firms. This is how I started. And in uh, about 99, I joined Zurich Financial Services at the time as the chief actuary for the um, Zurich's in reinsurance activities worldwide. And then um, a few years later, went along as the chief risk officer with the um, spin-off of the reinsurance activities of Zurich, which was a reinsurance company called Convarium. Um, I stayed there until uh, 2006 and then actually uh, left and founded the company with uh, Dirk in 2007. Dirk has a similar background. You know, again, reinsurance, he was with Zurich, this is where, uh, where we met, and actually Dirk hired me and, and attracted me to Zurich at the time. But his, his career is with um, Hanover Re for you know, uh, a very long time, I think 17 years with Hanover Re. So re really, we are coming out of the insurance and reinsurance industry. And that's somewhat uh, true also for the team. There's a team of 12 people working at Sequero, full-time staff. A bit more than half of the team is also coming out of the insurance and reinsurance industry. The other half essentially is um, asset managers and administration and, and marketing and so on. Sequero is a specialist asset manager and you invest in insurance-linked securities. Mm -hmm. Tell us, what are insurance-linked securities? Insurance-linked securities are securities or assets that transform re or insurance risk into capital markets. So it comes in, def in different formats. It could be in bond format. It could be as a derivative. It could be um, as collateralized reinsurance. In essence, it's any type of format that transfers insurance, the underlying insurance risk, into an instrument that can be bought by an, uh, an investor in the capital markets. The instruments that are most known to uh, people are the uh, so-called catastrophe bonds. They uh, securitize or they transform natural catastrophe risks such as U.S. hurricane exposure or Japanese earthquake exposure into a security which then can be bought in in the marketplace just like a, an equity or um, like a, like any other bond for investors what are the advantages and benefits of investing in these insurance linked securities probably the outstanding uh, differentiator compared to other assets is it's very low correlation with other financial markets products. Um, Insurance-linked securities are uh, very independent of what's happening in financial markets. If you think about uh, a sovereign debt crisis or you think about uh, the financial crisis uh, in 2007 and eight, this was a crisis of the markets but has nothing to do with, for example, natural catastrophes because financial markets tank, it doesn't mean at all that an earthquake is going to happen or a, a hurricane in the U.S. is going to happen. So they behave very independently and you can prove very nicely how 
the insurance linked securities prices are very very stable and move you know totally um, disconnected from uh, financial markets and, and that's a big benefit to investors I mean you know when everything kind of starts going down then it has been the case in the last years uh, again and again that insurance linked securities kind of went very stable and and usually are up that's the other advantage it's the risk return relationship if you kind of plot the S&P 500 um, or MSCI against or, or certain uh, bond uh, indices against the uh, natural catastrophe bond index index that is published by by Swiss Re you can actually see it just runs very very steady so volatility is extremely low and you know if, if you look at at, at you know the, the curve how it moves and you think about absolute return that's probably as close as it gets it's it's a very very steady way up and that's a big benefit to investors because they don't have to worry about ILS together with financial markets they have to worry if at all in the context of natural catastrophes or or as the case may be other insurance risk as they occur maybe that's you know just highlighting a few of the other components natural catastrophe is one thing but it could also be aviation risk it could be marine risks such as um, recently the the um, uh, cruise ship that uh, just think about you know the cruise line at Costa Concordia which uh, just had an accident off the coast of Italy that is a major if not one of the biggest uh, losses in the marine history and and that is something that you know also comes into the insurance linked security market so it could affect investors but then again that has nothing to do with equity markets and vice versa so that's one very big benefit that that investors can capitalize on also life insurance risks are part of the universe that is um, dealt with in the insurance linked space and that is something that you know we also want, you know, are looking at and it's it's very important to even within insurance linked securities you can diversify between different types of risk life and non-life risks between you know within the cat space between North America and Japan and Europe but also um, between property and marine and aviation so how are you yourself with Sequero diversified into all these different risks well indeed we are diversified and and I think this is our strategy I mean we are not only looking at a, a segment or part of the universe our strategy and vision is to look at the entire space and yes indeed we are invested in cat bonds as you know many others are but we also invested in marine risks and we have in our flagship fund the Cayman offshore fund has about half of it is invested in life insurance risks so you know it's it, it gets a maximum of, of diversification in our view of course when you look at each of those risks and transactions that are being brought to you and offered key determinant uh, determinant is is this a prof profitable transaction or not and does it really contribute value to the portfolio diversification by itself of course is not enough it needs to add value and if it's profitable if it diversifies that's kind of the best of all worlds if you want When you are diversified and when you are invested in all these different risks and insurance linked, linked securities, is there actually a way to manage risk? Well, that's actually a very good and interesting question. I mean, you could be very philosophical and say, well, insurance and reinsurance, what is this all about? I mean, this is all about risk. It's about, you know, the risk of running a loss. This is what, you know, people in the insurance and reinsurance uh, industry grow up with. So, that's something that we focus on and yes indeed we analyze each and every transaction in terms of its profitability of course but we we do look very much at what the risk in those transactions are 
And if you look at insurance link securities, oftentimes think about natural catastrophes. They happen very rarely, but if they happen, they are very, very expensive. So they are clearly tail risks, what we call tail risks. They are very rare, low frequency, but if they happen, they're expensive, high severity. So that's really kind of what we focus on. We focus a lot on assessing the tail of the distribution representing the risk. And, and we do that by every, each and every transaction, but we also do this in the portfolio context. If you ask me how much time do you spend on this, I think, we, you know, uh, it, it's a lot. I mean, this is we're spending, you know, probably a day per week at least really kind of looking and, and, and thinking about the risk profile of the fund and how each and every transaction uh, contributes to the portfolio and how it behaves in the portfolio overall. That's really the key issue when one looks at a tail, what we call a tail heavy class, asset class, and ILS are such a class. That's key um, in, in actually managing that. And we do have, um, in our team I mentioned, um, we are all insurers and reinsurers, or many of us are. Well, in fact, the people, I mean, I was the chief risk officer of a reinsurance company. The people who are working for me here are actuaries and modelers. I mean, again, they look at risk all the time. They try to quantify what the risk and, and what the return is. And, and that's, that's absolutely key. One has to have this entire skill set um, and experience from the markets, you know, how, how to assess it, how to maybe use models, uh, a number of models, uh, in particular in the uh, catastrophe space, how to use them and how to even use their outputs and adjust their outputs because a model is a model. It's not perfect. Specifically, that means you're actually also taking risks out of your portfolio when you come to the conclusion that it's not worthwhile or that it's too risky? Well, absolutely. We do that. And uh, that's one of the nice things being, you know, a fund manager in the insurance link space. You can buy and you can sell. Something that insurance or reinsurance companies have a hard time doing. I mean, they buy, they take risks, but it's hard for them to get rid of risks. Now, we assess our portfolio and the transactions in the portfolio continuously. We look at prices that are quoted in the market and we con continuously look whether we get enough return for the risk that we take. And I'll give you one very good and maybe prominent example, you know, where we did that quite successfully. In late 2010, we were of the view that the prices paid for Japanese earthquake risk were actually very high. The bonds were trading, you know, way above par. And looking at, you know, the coupons that they were paying and the remaining time to maturity, we were of the opinion that, you know, the return, the discount margin that we could earn on those transactions were really kind of substandard. They weren't paying enough for the risk. So in fact, we decided in the last quarter of 2010, to get rid of most, if not all, of our Japanese earthquake exposure. It happened that in March 2011, the major, a uh, big earthquake was hitting, was hitting Japan, the Tohoku earthquake, and one uh, bond, Mutiki, was triggered um, uh, in the market. It's a bond that we were holding uh, in the past, and it was one of the bonds where we just said, it's just not paying enough for the risk that it's you know offering in the in the portfolio so we actually shifted to something else you could say well that is exactly portfolio management it's looking after risk and return in the portfolio context and and you know drawing consequences for individual transactions and here you could argue well that was also a lucky punch because you don't know when the, when the earthquake um, happens but it was an absolutely natural and, and logical thing for us, and we do that with every transaction, to look at this and, and divest or conversely invest. When we see that prices are trading below what we think they should be trading or they are good in the context of the portfolio that we hold, then we would, would buy that transaction. In the ILS space, when it comes to CAD bonds, 
they can be traded uh, quite nicely and easily at most of the times. So um, there, there's that's, liquidity. That's, there's a market. There, there is there is a market. I mean, in particular for you know the 144A type bonds. I mean. It's not high frequency trading you get in and out three times a day, but it's something that you can sell typically within 24 hours or 48 hours at most, depending maybe on the size of the ticket. In that respect, it's, you know, maybe similar to equity markets, but it's not high frequency trading. It's an over the counter market, but it's really quite liquid. There are a number of funds that are active now in this insurance-linked security sector. How is Sequero different? Well, how are we different? I mentioned before, we don't limit ourselves to cat risk only. We cover the entire range of insurance products and, and we have the skill sets within our team, with which I believe is absolutely crucial and, and absolutely mandatory if you want to do that. But Another thing where we are different is we don't only want to invest in what's being offered to us and brought to us. It's not like we are waiting for transactions to come to us. Indeed, they do come, but we also want to grow the market. We want to develop the market. So we actually do approach um, sponsors, parties who want maybe want to transfer risk into the capital markets. We, we do approach them and think with, uh, through with them how that could actually be done. That's quite an intense process and, you know, doesn't come by chance or, you know, by coincidence. It needs to be done in a focused way. And, and there's, there's actually quite nice evidence of, of us having done a transaction just uh, early in, in, in 2011 where we brought a uh, a transaction to market which was securitizing the value in force of a European life insurance portfolio and securitized that into the market. It was a 60 million euro transaction that we actually structured ourselves, that we kind of converted or transformed into the market and then if, um, ultimately also found co-investors who were, you know, investing into this transaction. We are invested or there are also uh, six or seven other investors. So that's a bit like a, if you want, a mission we are on. It's a vision that we have that we really want to expand the market. We want to grow the market beyond what you know, most people know today, uh, natural catastrophes. And just, you know, as with this life transaction, that's really, if you go back in history, not the first one. If you look at where Dirk and I are coming from, let's just quickly talk about Dirk. He actually was with Hanover, you know, in the, in the 90s. And in 1994, Hanover was actually the issuer of the first cat bond called Cover at the time. And that's exactly what Dirk was doing. That was a, a job that he was doing at Hanover. So he really is a pioneer going back to 1994, having done um, this first cat bond. Uh, there was a sequence, you know, following afterwards. The market was kind of starting slowly in the late 90s and growing, growing, growing. And that's something that, you know, he continued doing with follow-up transactions at Hanover. Then we jointly did transactions at Zurich and Converium together. And each of those transactions, in fact, had some new features which were a first-timer at the time and now, today, are, you know, absolute market standards like multi parallel bonds or uh, second event covers. Those were things that we did actually at Converium and, and, and Zurich at the time, and they were innovations to the market. So I think, you know, that's where we're different in a way. We have this track record of innovation, and frankly, we don't want to stop here. We want to continue going, and, and there is evidence with this live transaction, and we'll see what the next one is going to be. So how do you see the whole industry of insurance-linked securities and managers that invest into this sector? How do you see this developing over time now? Where, where is it heading? Well, a very simple answer to your question would be, it's going to be growing. Now, what exactly do I mean by that? Part of it will be gr continued growth 
um, in the natural catastrophe area. There is an accumulation of values in, in developed and, and emerging countries. And, and while insurance or cat bonds are mostly focused on the um, developed countries, you know, the high value areas, um, we will see more and more in, you know, the, the emerging countries. I mean, just as an example, we always think about the US, we think about Europe, we think about Japan, and maybe a little bit of Australia, a little bit of Mexico when it comes to value concentration and where the risks are. Well, we just had, you know, a major catastrophe in Thailand with the floods becoming very, very expensive to the insurance and reinsurance industry. And, and it's, it's perfect evidence that there could very well be developing the need for and, and, and uh, uh, request for capacity from those type of areas. And I wouldn't be uh, surprised if we were to see some of those countries um, or those risks coming to the markets in one way or another. So that, that's just one area. I think it's, it's also uh, uh, compounded by the fact that insurers and reinsurers are increasingly seeing a capital as a scarce resource. I mean, that's always been the case, but in the last 12 months, the balance sheets um, were decimated by a whole series of major losses with quakes in, in, uh, in New Zealand, with uh, the Japan uh, earthquake, with the Thailand floods, uh, with a major flood in Australia, and so on and so on. So there is actually, even from reinsurance companies, there is more and more need to you know, tap into wider resources being the capital markets. A trend or effect that's com again compounding is that regulators pay much more attention to risk-based capital these days. I mean, just if you look at Europe, the Solvency II uh, activities where, you know, the European Union is, is, is introducing a risk-based capital regime for insurance and reinsurance industry leads to higher capital requirements. And, and that, in our view, will also help to grow the market. And our personal view is that the biggest growth is probably not in the cat area, but it could very well be in the life insurance area, where um, companies are very much feeling the crunch of return on capital and capital requirements. So it, it, it comes from several sources, and it's co a compounding effect where in the mid to long term we see continued growth um, in you know in the cats so on the in the cat area but also in the other areas life probably being a bit more of a dominant factor but you could also argue the more or less losses you have big losses the more need there is to actually go to markets take the marine loss the costa concordia We'll see. Um, there is capacity in the reinsurance market, but I'm pretty sure that we will see marine risk coming to market as it did in the past, but it may actually come to the market more than it, you know, it, it did recently. So what is the capacity of Sequero looking at the instruments that you're investing in? How far do you think you can build the assets of your fund? Capacity depends a little bit on uh, the scope of the investments. Uh, on the universe, one can limit oneself to CAT only and then, you know, I'd say it's, you know, anything like, you know, around 500 million or 750 million as a, as a capacity is easily doable and and one can you know reasonably trade do trades in and out if one goes beyond a million just limited on that universe it becomes quite a bit more challenging on the other hand there are it's also a function of instruments if collateralized reinsurance or sidecars even are part of the equation then you know one can go a little broader but at the same time and i think that's maybe the counter Part to that liquidity terms become you know, less favorable. I mean, this is not like trading in and out very easily. So if one has a mid to longer term horizon, then you know one one you know can look at more instruments and and increase capacity. Now one can also you know add a lot of other instruments 
like you know marine and and so on where the market is admittedly quite a bit smaller than in the cat space but it diversifies and then you know increases the fund and the cap capacity going another step into live transactions and specifically value in force embedded value type of transactions they usually have quite a chunky volume i mean you i mean we did a 60 million euro transaction i would say that's rather at the small lower end of the size people would normally target sponsors would target three digit volumes to be brought to the market and then obviously if you take those transactions and build a portfolio around that you very quickly reach a volume that's you know several hundred millions would certainly be uh, beyond 500 million and possibly even beyond beyond a billion now it doesn't happen from one day to the next it will take time and it needs long-term investors people with a long-term horizon such as pension funds and so on and for them it could you know for those type of in investors i think there is quite a lot of capacity in the market i'm hesitant to put a number you know to each of the buckets but you know i think it's a function of instruments of uh, the universe one is looking at and in life i think in particular there's a lot of potential for if you want big numbers so who is your typical investor who are the investors it's there's not a typical investor per se it's it's really the whole range of of uh, the universe pension funds are very much indeed interested and big investors in the space uh, but we also um, have family offices investing uh, we have insurers and reinsurers even who would like to diversify maybe the book they're actually writing on their on the liability side they want to and, and successfully can diversify um, by investing in, in uh, insurance linked securities and it is um, asset managers or banks who are looking at alternative assets that diversify you know the other assets that they offer equities and then and, and bonds they any alternative or managers with alternative asset focus are, are clearly our the parties we talk to and the parties who are investing within insurance linked security is there anything you wouldn't invest in and why in principle we're happy to invest in anything if we can see the risk return relationship be beneficial to the investor uh, it's a matter of doing that analysis and convincing ourselves that the return that we get for the risk that we take is appropriate one area that to date we haven't been we couldn't warm up to is the area of secondary life or life settlements um, that's an area where you know we, we we do monitor the market but we also believe that this is a very uh, this is a market where the incentive the chain of incentives is not necessarily in favor of the investor and the alignment of interest is not you know as as positive and, and as it should be so this is still a market w which we continue to screen and uh, we observe but we have never been uh, have never become comfortable with, with investing in any of that space and frankly we don't we don't necessarily see that happening in the near future but there are always surprises we'll, we'll see what we do do in the in the life space is we're looking at you know what people uh, many people know are extreme mortality bonds i mean there are a number in the market but what we are very much interested in are what we call portfolio based uh, transactions where there are large existing blocks of insurance policies um, are, are kind of transferred into capital markets. I'll give you an example. The transaction that we did, um, Revita, didn't have, you know, a, well, a handful, two or three dozen of policies or maybe a hundred policies, as often is the case in those life settlement transactions. The one that we were actually uh, looking at had, had more than a hundred thousand policies behind that. So it's really a, a very big, very stable and balanced portfolio, which again we need to analyze we need to understand you know, which is quite a lot of work but it's it's still you know something that is is quite different from 
a handful or a number or a few dozen of policies as, as is, is the case in the life settlements. We like portfolio based. We like, you know, big chunks, usually of, of existing business where we understand why the sponsor wants to transfer this to the capital market. And very often it is growth in other areas of the business, um, uh, freeing up capital for you know all kinds of purposes. Um, the motivation is very important for us to understand. And that's something that we really fancy quite a lot. Is now a good time to invest in insurance-linked securities? And overall, I think, yes, it is a good time. There's never a perfect time, if you wish. And many people do claim, however, after losses, it's, it's perfect to go into the market. Yes, indeed, if you miss the losses and if you invest now and nothing is going to happen, yeah, then this is a good time. What is clear is after losses, and we had a series of losses, including a major earthquake in Japan last year, prices or coupons are going up. So the risk that you take is compensated better than it was maybe 12 months ago. So in that respect, yes, it's a good time to enter the market. But what would be suboptimal, if not the wrong approach, is to wait for another earthquake or for another event and just hope that prices are going to go up. I mean, remember, we're talking about tail risk, something that you know happens quite rarely even though we had a number of events last year, you could be sitting there, you know, for 10 or 15 years waiting for the optimal time just to find out, well, looking back, there were a number of good times and pretty much any time to enter the market and one would have made very decent returns with very low correlation to other markets. So I think it's, it's a, a justifiable question, you know, is a good time? Yes, I think it's better now than it was maybe you know, 12 or 18 months ago, but I don't think, you know, what one should, like in capital markets, wait for a drop in the uh, S&P of, you know, 18 or 20 or 25 percent and say, now is a good time to invest. It's, it's not as volatile and I think one is looking for stable returns for something that's, you know, long-term, absolute return. And I think now is as good as any time, but maybe slightly better than, you know, it would be on average.